today by the grace of God and there's just a 50% reduction in, in the pain that's been in my body and I'm so grateful and I want to give him the glory to do prayers and uh, when I asked him who are you to me today he said to me I'm your most prized possession and I just wanted to share that with you Well, you, you need to thank God that you feel. Yeah, I'm a lot better. And uh, Michelle's here. We're going to pray about what you sent me the other day. Yeah. Before we're out of here today. But, you know, I was, I was given gratitude in, in the worship. I mean, I forgot. My, some of you aren't here, but my grandson ended up here. And we got to lay hands on him. He had a, a concussion. And my daughter was here, and I thought, why didn't we pray for her? So I had my other granddaughter come here and have her life completely changed all week. And then I had my grandson, who had a concussion, wanted to see my church, right? My church, our church. Yeah, wanted turned, to see the church. Yeah, he was here the day before he turned 12 on Thursday. So, so we got to pray, and he was crying, and my daughter was crying. So, I mean... I have gratitude. And I, like some of you weren't here when I first said, God will not be mocked. What we sow, we will reap. He will not be mocked. And I never saw that part of it. Maybe I read over it. We always said, whatever you sow, you reap. But are we mocking God when we don't believe? We get discouraged. How many times I was repenting? All the times I've been so discouraged, you know, we, we keep doing what he says, keep doing what he says, and, you know, you don't see the fruit, but God says, don't mock me. Don't mock me. I'm, what you sow, you're going to reap. It hit me in the third song, People Get Ready. That's right. That we've been sowing revival for years. Right, right. Yeah. But I told people years ago, it's not enough to pray for revival. We need to prepare. That's why we equip. That's why we teach schools. Because it's coming. We're going to reap. We are going to reap yeah. all that we have sown into. And I don't think, I don't think everyone here, so many people that are really mature in God, I don't think God poured all this in, in you just for you to be happy and know things. He has people lined up. I mean, it was, it was my children this week that we got to pour into, but there's been other people that, that have come here that we've poured into, and the things you've said have been so significant to them. You know, they, it, it, they remember, there were things they remember that say, oh, that this one said to me, or that one said to me. I mean, they remember. And did anybody else hear anything from Kitty Catherine? You're going back there. Some of you didn't hear this when Renee mentioned at the beginning. Mia, who was here all week, texted this morning and said, I miss church already. Uh, I, I miss, miss everyone, church. and I miss church already. Which is cute. Um, I've, I've just been trying so hard to get here all week. <laughs> so I know you I, passed us I up. Didn't, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, I didn't sleep Tuesday night, so I, I was planning to come Wednesday. I thought, Wednesday, I'm supposed to be there. And I didn't trust myself on the highway. And then Thursday, I took the wrong exit. There's many times the glare of the lights, and I didn't know where I was. <laughs> and I didn't have the address uh, for too many. And, uh, oh, Lord, I, I was driving around. I was way, way somewhere. And so I finally just put in my home address and went home. But this morning, and here am I, send me. I kept thinking, Lord, you know. I'm old. I mean, I took the wrong exit. I've been here. And he says, I know. I know. But I'm going to use you in ways you would never dream. You don't have to go far away. I'm going to use you. I see you. And so I say that to, to all of us. You know? And you just had another birthday. I did. I was, was, I was 85 years old wow. yesterday. Oh. That's why I didn't come last night. My husband and I went out to dinner. Oh, wow. <laughs> In the snow, and you were okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yo, we we walked down the hill to a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I Amen. 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 Catherine, blessings.
Maybe keep a few people in prayer. Um, yeah, lots Charlotte's of not people. feeling well today. How are they diagnosed with this cyst behind Baker his knee cyst. that just had the or replacement? Uh, um, still getting better. Sick. Yeah, she's still getting better. Um, what else? Can you pray for us? Yeah, let's just stand. We just stand in agreement right now for all those ones that um, aren't here today, Father. That you, whatever, whatever held them back, that your healing grace would be released upon them. Your peace, your shalom, peace would be upon them. That you would revive them, you would restore them, and um, and and as your word says, that by your stripes they were healed. And we're releasing and sending that healing grace to them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the only announcement I have is that we're going to have intercessors meeting. Saturday. Yeah, I think we're going to do a luncheon because I promised that we would have a Christmas party in December. And for the first time in several years, we just couldn't do it. There was just so much, you know, um, unit tests and so much went on. We just couldn't do it. Um, so. Um, when you're back, and I am so. You want to hop? Do you want to dance? Something I'll just say about good luck now. Would anybody else have a testimony before we go? You know, okay. We like those tests that come and then we've got testimonies about God's goodness and mercy. Steve, that light went out, so I don't know. Yeah, yes. So I had um, a quick praise report. In September, I was um, notified that I, my income wouldn't be um, supplemented, uh, and so I needed to apply to get um, assistance through UPMC. And so that was in September, and pretty much weekly, um, I had been like getting stuff together and supplying documents, and then they sent me another letter saying I need something else. And so um, it was like they wanted all the notes from every doctor I had ever seen because they also did an investigation to see if I knew about MS prior to um, the diagnosis, which I didn't. But it was just like one thing after another. And this morning I looked in my mailbox and I don't remember seeing it there. Perhaps it went to like one of my uh, one of the people that stay in the building or something, but I opened the letter, the letter when I got here and it said that it was approved after like a long and so what was this for to um supplement the income that i didn't have oh. coming in um uh from like going to work so i was making uh, just a little bit because my hours were restricted and so yeah I, that was a huge blessing to get they're gonna um starting from when i applied in september they're gonna they, give me yeah. um back pay that's supposed to come in march and so that's she a huge had blessing Amer uh, the testimony you gave me was, it was a long story, which we can't go into all of it, but you were oh, called yeah. here to Pittsburgh, oh, yeah. and that when you got here, you were very, something happened to you that you were uh, disabled, You, you, your whole side of your body. Yeah, so. If you um, could tell it real quick yeah, without all, right, all those other to, details. Yeah, 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 I'll try to make it the short and sweet version. So in March, I um, worked up, I work at Mercy Hospital, I worked overnight and got off on a Sunday. And usually I um, take a quick nap and then get up and go to church. And then I come back and like sleep the rest of the time that I should have slept. But I took my hour nap and woke up with no feeling down my left side. I got diagnosed with um, MS. I didn't know anything about MS and um, lost the ability to walk and use my hands. And the doctors told me that it was um, progressive MS and there's nothing that they can do. Um, that I'd be in a wheelchair to assign me PT um, to learn how to transfer in and out of a wheelchair, but God um, had to find a say, not the doctors, and so despite them not giving me treatment and having no hope, um, God restored my, my walking and um, use of my hands, and yeah, it has just proven itself faithful, as um, all of us can, can well, testify. Well, the funny part was he said, uh, they, they sent a priest in to give you last rites. Am I right? Yeah. 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 Um, 
Yeah, so that's how bad. Yeah, they sent the priest in, and at Mercy, they don't pray for healing. They send the priest in when they have decided that you're going to die. <laughs> and so I started telling him uh, him scripture, like giving him scripture for all the reasons I don't need him praying me over, because that's not how it's ever worked. <laughs> um, and so they took me, you know, obviously, he took me off the list after that conversation. Um, <laughs> but I still, when I see them, I still continue that conversation. <laughs> Yeah, and um, you know, do a little little hot because they said I wouldn't be uh, <laughs> wouldn't be walking again. And so um, yeah, it's all all glory to God. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's just a testimony of God's goodness. Aren't you glad yeah. that God has the final say, not the doctors? Yeah, and I told them that, and I I stood on His word, and um, they recently offered me medication now that He's done a healing, and I was like, no, I'm healed. By His stripes, I'm healed. So. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. When, when she was talking about the um, the income that came through, could I wanted to say, can camels anybody are, say the camels, camels are coming? Are coming. Yeah. The camels yeah. are coming. The camels are coming. They're coming. The Some of them are here. <laughs> There's more coming. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have to say, and I don't normally say something like this. I don't think. I was amazed at the songs mm -hmm. and how, I mean, cause I just put, you know, I put together a list by prompting and try not to play my favorite stuff, <laughs> even though some of it's really it's my favorite stuff. <laughs> and, um, and it all ties in with the message. Uh -huh. right. You know, all it wasn't planned that way uh -huh. by me. I think God's doing something. And even the sowing and reaping thing, we how many believe we're going to reap revival? Amen. Amen. It's coming. Um, and God will not be mocked. God's That's not the be part mocked. we got to remember about sowing and reaping. God will not be mocked. Okay, how many want to do what Jesus did? Let's start with John 14, 12, familiar passage. I actually, when I got up on New Year's Day and went to the office, I wasn't sure what I was going to read and uh, opened the Bible up and it just fell to a place and I'll tell you where that place is in a minute. But um, Renee, you know, she pastors me all week usually about you know what you're going to talk on you, you finish your message at it's like, he makes me nervous because he's so relaxed yeah anyway I I couldn't get away from this one verse and it's not the one that I'm going to start with but it's where we're going to land John 14 12 truly truly I say to you he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. I titled this, Doing What Jesus Did. But if we're going to do the works of Jesus, we're going to do what he did. We're going to have to have the same anointing and operate the same way he did. You know, he didn't leave us down here to do the best we can. I'm reminded we had a fellow here a few years ago, and I won't go into all the details, but um, I was really praying about how to approach the situation that we had. And the Lord just simply said, the, the um, anointing of the past season was insufficient for the new era. We can't ride yesterday's anointing into the future. God knows what we need, and it's a whole lot more than what we've had. Because we see the uh, chaos in the world, and even some of the songs that, you know, creation is groaning or shaking, and people are being prepared. They don't need, they even probably even know they're being prepared. Much of the church may not know they're being prepared, but it was what remnant wake up, bride wake up, 
Um, church, wake up. If we're going to do the works of Jesus, we're going to have to have the same anointing. And so I felt like we needed to look at some of the process that Jesus went through. Because we're going to have to walk through the same thing to carry what he carried. We have innate in, in us with the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power of Jesus. But Jesus didn't do things on his own initiative. And I want to start in Matthew 3. It's not the only account of the baptism of Jesus. But in chapter 3, beginning at 13, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee to Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permitted at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John, permitted him. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, depending on your translation, the heavens were open and he saw. It may be capitalized or not capitalized. So who was seeing? I think it's quite possibly that John and Jesus were both seeing it. Because it reads a little different in Luke's account, but I felt the start there in, in Matthew. But I really believe it's significant and have for many years that when the heavens were opened, Jesus began to see into the spirit like never before. See, he had worked with his father and then his father had passed. And there came a point where Jesus, I think, probably began to know that my time here in the carpenter shop, there are many days left. And I don't know exactly when he knew, but there came a point where he just hung up that apron or that, those tools for the last time. He said he'd build his church, but he wasn't going to do it the way he'd been building furniture or whatever. And he knew it was time. He had known from the time he was 12, at least, that he had to be about his father's business. But it wasn't time when he was 12. And now he's about 30. And it's time. So he goes down to John. And John's like, I mean, John knew he wasn't even worthy to untie his sandals. He says, you want me to baptize you? You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says to fulfill all righteousness. He, you know, as Christians, we need to be baptized. There are some denominations that believe that unless you're baptized in water, you're not saved. I'm going to have, going to have a hard time with that in Scripture. Because um, thief on the cross, people on their deathbed, they're not going to hell because they didn't get in the water. They got in the Spirit and got baptized in the body of Christ by their faith. But I believe it was that point and we know that John saw the dove because in John 1, uh, 132, you have to turn there. But John, John testifies saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. But in Luke, it, you know, it makes me clear, Jesus saw the dove, the Spirit. So I think they both saw it. So there's no contradiction in Scripture. You know, sometimes people get if we don't know our Bibles well, sometimes we can get confused by people's questions. Mm -hmm. I remember as a new believer, a, a, um, a so-called atheist, uh, said there was contradiction in Scripture because in one place it said there were 5,000 fed and in another place 4,000 fed. I mean, there was two different miracles. Right. No contradiction. What I believe is so significant is here, the heavens were open and Jesus saw. John 5, 19 says this. Can I go 
the page is fucking us and I can maybe move it on your phone, that's fine. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. The miracles that Jesus did, all the, whatever the kind, the healing, the multiplication of the food, he had to have seen it from his Father in the Spirit. There was a communication open when the heavens were opened. And Jesus was not lying, relying on his own understanding or his thought, you know, moved by, he was moved by compassion at times, but he wasn't moved by the crowds. Because they wanted to make him king, they wanted to, you know, follow him for different reasons. But he was on a mission. And we, you know, we're on a mission and we can't get distracted by what everybody else thinks we ought to be doing. But we're going to reap what we've sown. We've sown prayer after prayer after prayer for years about revival. So what are we going to reap? Revival. And we're not the only ones. So many of you have prayed revival as well. And one of those songs said, we don't know what it's going to look like, basically. It's going to be more than anything we've ever seen. And we just have to be prepared. And how do you do that? Stay in communication with the Father and do what he says to do. Um, some people wonder about John 14, 12, where it says, not only will we do what Jesus did, we'll do greater works. Well, how does that happen? Well, we just read John 5, 19. Let's look at verse 20, if you're there. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater things than these so that you will marvel. I think at this point, Jesus is actually prophesying. Like, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because <laughs> I know my Father is going to show me even more. And I think greater work is just something that you haven't done before. We haven't raised the dead yet. We haven't seen some of the miracles yet that we're going to see. And when when the Holy Spirit approaches us to do something that we haven't done before, it makes us uncomfortable. And I've had this conversation with the Lord many times. God, if you better do something or I'm going to look bad. You get past that because you realize that God shows up in response to obedience to his word. So we do things we've never done before, the greater things. I mean, I know the first time the Lord told us to have the healing service. Like, what? We believe in healing, right? Why can't we do healing services? I mean, we're going to have a healing time in February, just like we did with the prophetic presbytery. We're going to have healing teams and invite people from, to come in to receive ministry. Because we know that God wants to heal. And God wants to heal here and he wants to heal now. And he wants to heal through us. But something interesting happens, and this is part of the reason I think that I chose Matthew to talk about the baptism. Um, and I, you know, some people, and I've done this in the past, have reading plans you, and this was big at Christ for Nations. If you read three chapters a day and five on Sunday, you get through the Bible in a year. Okay, if you read the first three chapters of Matthew and stop there, you really miss what happens come next because the next day you might have forgot what happened yesterday and you're reading. Or if you miss a day or two and you didn't go try to catch up, you totally forgot possibly what happened in chapter three when Jesus is baptized and the heavens opened. You turn to the next chapter, which is the very next verse. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
we used to get really excited about getting prophetic words. I mean, we went to conferences. I hope they call me out. I hope they pray for me. I learned that if you're going to, I mean, if our life is going to be like Jesus, it's very possible. I mean, you realize that Jesus had a prophetic word, right? Audible voice from heaven. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Where did he go next? The wilderness. If, if there's any chance to go into the wilderness right after a prophetic word, I'm not going to volunteer for get, you know. I still want God to speak, but we just have to understand that's part of the process. We don't always like the process, but this is the process that Jesus went through. And there was things that he had to deal with in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil. And I don't, I'm just going to highlight those. They're in Matthew 4 as well as Luke 4, but they're not in the same order. And I'm not sure how significant that is. Uh, they both start with the same one, which is turning. Uh, will you tell me what was the first one? Stones to bread. Turning stones to bread. Well, the con we have, well, let's back up a little bit in the context. So he's led in this by the Spirit in, in one, tra one um, not translation even, but another gospel. It says he was compelled. Like you're going into the wilderness, willing or not. You know, you, you can be driven in or you can just follow the leading of the Lord. But he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And one of the one of the Gospels, God doesn't leave you in the wilderness. He actually leads you while you're there. And it's not punishment. It's preparation. Verse 2 in Matthew 4. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Now, we did call a 10-day fast at your discretion. You fast how you felt led. I mean, we're doing a partial fast, basically eating one meal a day. I have done, we have done, I think we did one 21 day together. Um, I, it was just liquid, and I did a 40-day fast with liquid. But liquid back in those days was anything. I mean, I was drinking milkshakes and Dr. Pepper and... Um, <laughs> You know, in fact, I was telling Danny Chambers one day about fasting, and I told him I was drinking. He said, that's not fast. <laughs> well, fasting is between you and the Lord. Yeah. You know, some people can't fast food because they got to take medicine. Um, I'm, I'm thankful now that some of the stuff that I had to take, and I had to take with medicine, I'm off of. So now I can eat less. So... Anyway, what I have noticed is what this verse says. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and then he was hungry. It is actually possible to not be hungry during fasting. It'll bother you for a day or two, maybe three, but if you get past that, it's like, it's no big deal. You're not even hungry. You can prepare food for others. You can be around the smells and not be tempted because God has put you in that place to talk to you. So 40 days and 40 nights he's fasted and then he became hungry. So what's the devil do? He shows up with this question. Or not even a question. He says, if you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And what's significant about the devil's statement? If. If. Because G the Father had just said to the Son from heaven, this is my beloved Son. You are my beloved Son. And the devil comes along and says, what if you're God's Son? You ever had the devil come to you and try to um, counteract some of the prophecies that you've been given? Well, you think you're called to do that? Yeah. Because God said it. We have to understand that if God said it, that should settle it. We just need to start believing it as well. And Jesus responds, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I've heard these Three temptations taught different ways, and you probably have too, but I'm going to share the ways that God gave it to me at one point. This temptation 
is something that all of us have to deal with if we're going to serve the Lord. Self-sufficiency. we got to trust Him. But that was a temptation to take matters in your own hand, Jesus. I know you're hungry. Just do something. That you're, I mean, you're the miracle worker, right? Take these stones and make yourself something to eat. We get tempted sometimes to take things into our own hand and become self-sufficient. I don't know what the parade is outside. But is there anybody else left? A lot of people going by. So the first temptation would be self-sufficient. And in the order of Matthew, the second temptation is what? Being uplifted. So he didn't dash his foot. Yeah, to yeah. jump off. Jump off. Jump off. Throw yourself Tempt down. Tempting. Or temptation. Verse 5, the devil took him up into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. I don't know if there's a vision or real. He said to him, if, there it is again, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. And why? For it is written, now the devil's going to start quoting scripture to Jesus. He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Is that all true? That's true. Yeah. But Jesus said, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. There's a lot of things in Scripture we can do. But we better not do it out of time. So the temptation here is to be presumptuous. Well, it's in the Bible. I mean, I, I've, I've gotten into discussions, heat, not heated, terribly heated, but significant discussions with people that argue with me that we have uh, all authority and we just, just, just need to exercise it. We have all authority, that's true, but we don't have all authorization. Right. Jesus only did what he saw his father do. We have all the authority, but we don't want to get out in front of God and start doing something he had told us to do. And the devil can quote scripture to try to get us, well, just, you, you, look, you know, this has happened to a lot of people in ministry. Well, I'm just going to step out, I'm going to quit my job and live by faith. Because God supplies all of our needs. Where God provides, guys, he provides. But if God didn't tell you to quit your job, don't quit your job. Wait till the job gets pulled out from under you. I've had that happen before. Um, I had one job I'm not going to go into. But I mean, it's a really good part-time job. It's significant in pay and benefits and all of that. And I'm hearing the Holy Spirit say to me on a regular basis, I have need of you, I have need of you. And Renee said, you can't quit this job. I said, what the Lord's saying, I have need of you. She said, you can't quit this job. I, said, I finally said, okay, I won't quit. I go after my one-year review. I said, not based on your performance, but because, because of the lawsuit against the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh. We no longer require your services. I promised her I wouldn't quit. I couldn't had no control over getting laid off. But you don't quit. You don't step out unless God says get out. Remember, when, when did Peter get out of the boat? Told to. When he was told. When Jesus said come, yeah. don't step out presumptuously into things. Okay, third temptation. Verse 8, the devil took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Jesus was offered a shortcut to what he already knew was going to be his inheritance. And the devil says, you don't have to do anything. Just fall down and worship me. I'll give Because the devil had all of that by right from Adam and Eve's sin. 
So Jesus came to take back and undo the works of the devil. And the devil saying to Jesus, look, okay, I, I understand that you're coming for the kingdom. But that's all in the future. You can have right now, though, if you want. All you got to do, and this has happened to a lot of musicians. They sell out to the devil, and they receive all the glory, and their life goes to hell. And they maybe they do too, unless they repent at some point. But there are people that have bought into that. Just bow down to me, and I'll give you all the glory. The temptation here is to compromise. I need to understand it's all about the worship. Who are we going to worship? We can't compromise. God calls us to do something. We don't compromise. Okay, so Jesus has been to the river. He's been baptized. He's been tempted. Now what? Anybody know what happens next? So the temptations and what happens next in Luke are broken up by, I think, a genealogy. But in Luke 4, 14, it says this. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of his spirit. He's done no miracles. He goes down to fulfill righteousness, comes up out of the water, and the heavens open. Now he's in communion with his father like he's never been before. He returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. The news began about him began to spread all the, through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and praised and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, as was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the, the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Put it in modern language. Jesus was saying, um, this 700-year-old prophecy, today it was fulfilled. You got words, you got prophecy. There is a point that is fulfilled. Nothing left out, nothing missing. We'll just keep doing our part. Most people don't understand the process. That's why the scripture would say, many are called and few are chosen. Because we, people tend to weed themselves out of the process. Because if you're going to carry the glory, you've got to be basically dead to yourself. This is, you know, this is not so Ray and Renee can be famous. We just want to be functional. We want to be uh, used by the Lord. But it's not about building a ministry. I pray that it has um, wave after wave of outreach. And, and impact but not for us for our glory but for his because he's not going to share his glory with us with any of us I told you on New Year's Day I opened the Bible I mean I just opened it sometimes you can open it day after day and it will fall open to the same place and many times you just open it day after day and it just it's not by the same I opened it up on New Year's Day to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 is what we call what Jesus read from in Luke 4. And some of us actually, you know, I don't know if we'll do it in this service. But we got to start speaking to ourselves. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel. In the Old Testament Isaiah account, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news 
That's the definition of the gospel, is good news. Turn and burn is the truth, but it doesn't sound like good news. Turn or burn. You know, is repent. The gospel is good news. You don't have to threaten people with hell. Show them the love of Jesus. Uh, what did say? Was it Francis of Assisi said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and use words as necessary. We can demonstrate the kingdom, but we don't do it presumptuously. If God says, pray for the person out in public, or invite the Holy Spirit to come, we just do what he says. We're not responsible for the results. Sometimes healings manifest immediately, and sometimes they don't. Our job is to do what he tells us. And he says, lay hands on the sick and pray for them. It's up to him. Some people got healed. The lepers got healed when they went, as they went. Let's look at some of the... See, when Jesus quoted this, or read from it, I, he didn't read the whole thing. Isaiah says, Sit. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted or the poor, depending on your translation. Poor in spirit, they're afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. The word brokenhearted means to have a shattered mind. How many people are just torn in all directions with trauma and tragedy and all sorts of things? He's, he's, he, the Messiah was sent. He's sending us to bind up the broken heart. If we're going to do what he did, these are, these are, this is the assignment. To bind up the broken hearted. <clears throat> and to proclaim liberty to captive and freedom to prisoners. It reads a little different in other translations, but this is significant. Because captives and prisoners are different. We've talked about that before. I'm not going to elaborate in detail. But captives are imprisoned through the lie, through lies and deception, or they're prisoners of war. And prisoners are criminals that the judge is sent to jail. And you see that in the parable in, in Luke, uh, Matthew 18. Because of unforgiveness, the man was thrown into prison until his debt was paid. So people get in bondage all different ways. And so sometimes we need the discernment to find out what's got them bound. You know, sometimes you minister to people, they want healed, yeah, but are you willing to forgive? Well, sometimes it's like, well, I've tried, and it's, I understand that we've had people tell us in prayer lines that, no, I, I, will not, I will not forgive that person. And they've ended up in terrible torment. Verse 2 in Isaiah 64, to proclaim the favorable, favorable or acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance for our God. See, Jesus left out the day of vengeance part. There's a gap there in time for the fulfillment. To comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle or garment of praise instead of a spirit of fainting or heaviness, so they will be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So what happens in the favorable or acceptable year of the Lord? The brokenhearted are healed. People are comforted. I mean, they get garland, which it could be a headdress or a turban instead of ashes. Instead of mourning, the oil of gladness. Instead of a spirit of fainting or heaviness, a garment of praise. I, I like the New American Standard it says a mantle. How many, a lot of people are interested in you know, having a mantle. How about the mantle of praise to break the spirit of heaviness in our own lives? There are songs of deliverance that people can sing over others, but sometimes you've got to get free. And sometimes, I mean, the Lord wants us to grow up so that some things we don't have to call everybody we know to get them to pray for us. 
We're going to learn how to stand on our two feet spiritually. And what happens is, is it, we become the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Is verse 4. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. And they will repair the ruined cities. The desolations of many generations. So the question is, because it's mentioned one, two, three times. Who is they? Who are they that are going to rebuild the ancient ruins, raise up the former devastations, repair the ruined cities? Who's going to do that? The same people that were bound and broken before. Because the, the, the healed get to become the healers. Those that have been delivered get to become deliverers. And so it's amazing. And, and in one way, it's not. How, how many have had some brokenness in their lives? How many of you ever thought like this? God, if I was you, I wouldn't pick me. Well, God's not picking us based on our past. He's picking us based on our calling, which he predetermined before we were born. With an assignment from Ephesians 10 to walk in good works, which he's previously planned for us. So, we are the ones that are going to rebuild the ancient ruins, raise up the former devastations, and repair the ruined cities. Those that have been, and these desolations of many generations. Doesn't matter what your family history tree looks like. We can totally interrupt that with the anointing and the power of God. But we have to understand there's a process. The brokenhearted get healed. The captives know the truth and are set free. Prisoners know the freedom of forgiveness. These are the people that God will use. Not those that think they're qualified, not those necessarily went to Bible college. It doesn't hurt. There's no guarantee. I know people backslid after Bible college. We are the ones that God was going to do all the things that we sang about this morning. He's going to use us, send us, anoint us, but understand there's a process. We got to learn to deal with the devil. We got to learn with the, to deal, you know, self-sufficiency. Um, um, get confusing this. Compromise. And what was the middle one? Presumption. Presumption. We're going to walk in the fullness of the Spirit. We got to deal with that. And Jesus dealt with it in the wilderness. That's where we're going to deal with it is in our wilderness times and we have a friend that bless her heart I mean she supports our ministry now but years ago I remember the day that she stood in front of us and said because um, we were talking about the wilderness and she said I've never been there and I'm thinking to myself I didn't say it to her but I said to myself probably go on there soon <laughs> either that or you're lying that you've never been there. We all got to go through the process. If we go through the process, we're going to do the things that Jesus did in the same way that he did because we'll have the same anointing. Yeah, I mean, if we just casually read John 14, 12 and, and go try to do the, the things that Jesus did or even the greater things, it's probably not going to work if we're doing it presumptuously. But if we learn how God operates, how did Jesus operate? He only did what he saw his father do. And there's two other verses in John, um, I think it's chapter 8 and chapter 12, that talk about not doing anything 
on his own initiative. I said this years ago, um, God is not obligated to bless what we start or initiate. How many of you have ever prayed this prayer? God, I'm going to do this for you. I just need you to bless me. It doesn't work that way. We just have to learn the process and how God works. And we'll see that God will do amazing things. So the bottom line I have on my notes is let's submit to the process and walk in the anointing of Jesus. Understand there's a process and it doesn't last forever. And I had an interesting thought about the sowing and reaping thing. Because I think we've been praying and sowing into sowing prayers into revival for about 25 years. That's how long Abraham and Sarah waited for their promise. We're going to reap. We're all going to reap together. Father, I thank you for this family of believers. They're not all here today. But Father, they've chosen to be a part of what you're doing. We're so grateful for that. I know, Lord, that apart from you, I, we, can do nothing. But with your spirit, I and we can do all things because you strengthen us. And so, Father, I pray for a strengthening of spirit today. And anyone that's feeling a little weak spiritually, anyone that's a little bit down, I just declare again, breakthrough's coming, camels are coming, revival's coming. We're going to reap what we've sown. I thank you for your people today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you all on Facebook.